Now that we've finished up on the Swan Princess series, it's time to look at something that I've been wanting to review for ages. Freddy the Frog. <laughs> I'm gonna rule your world. Freddy the Frog, or as it's originally called, Freddy as F-R-O-7, is a British animated movie that's directed, written, and produced by John Osevsky. Production began back in 1989 and lasted three years. And while Miramax initially put the movie in theaters over in the U.S., a poor showing at the box office prevented it from reaching home video, at least until MCA and Universal Home Video did in 1995. But not without some editing and narration done by James Earl Jones. That said, I will be looking at the unedited version. According to Asefsky, his project was based on the bedtime stories he told about his son's frog toy actually being a secret agent. After seeing Anya turn her plush toys into secret agents and spy family, I wouldn't mock the idea. I mean, we all have our play-pretend moments, but to have your far-fetched imagination turn into a movie? Well, let's see what an $18 million budget can do with that concept in Freddy as F.R.O. 7. As we open on Paris, the movie boldly states how this is an amazing fantasy of a new kind. Also, apologies for the low quality. This is the best I can find as it was never re-released on Blu-ray. Still, the movie looks to have the sort of 90s art quality from detailed backgrounds, character designs, and animation. Not too bad for the London-based Hollywood Road film production studio. So now I have to wonder, what else did they work on? Really? Just two movies? Well, at least they got John Goodman for the other one. The only living things we see in Paris are our title character and some kind of living car that makes frog noises. Guess someone in Benny's family married a frog or something. Anyway, upon arriving in his rather swanky living space, he begins looking back on his youth during... the medieval times? This movie is primarily set in the 90s, yet it seems Freddy was born centuries ago. How are they going to explain this one? Time travel? The narrator, voiced by Adrian Delatouche, explains how he was once a young boy named Frederick, whose father was a king and magician. His mother sadly died at sea, and he inherited his father's powers. With them, he could sense something watching him. That something being Messina, voiced by Billy Whitelaw. The sister of the king, Messina was her name, also had the power of magic. But hers, like the night, was black. Hey, what did he do to you? Turns out that Messina once turned into a snake and spooked the king's horse into dropping him, causing him to die from his injuries. Once Frederick ascends to the throne, she tries passing herself off as an advisor who could help him rule, when in reality, it's a ruse for her to kill him too and rule the kingdom. But here's how she decides to attack him. Yeah, this movie might have some decent 90s animation, but the way things play out doesn't always make sense. The edited version does try to make it less confusing and started the story in the past, but even still, there remains inconsistencies with the animation. So despite having magic energy beams, Messina opts to turn Frederick into a frog, then fails to even capture him as he jumps out a window. He lands in the ocean and struggles a bit, but a vision of his father encourages him to calm down and swim his way out of trouble. He does get cornered, only to be saved by... <coughs> Nessie, what are you doing here? You should go back to all the Dino Crocs and Piranacondas. Nessie scares Messina away, and so she vows to destroy Frederick after blurting out that she did the same to his parents. And then I shall be all powerful. I shall rule the world. Why not do that now? You don't even need to kill Freddy. So about the Loch Ness monster, Frederick tries to introduce himself, and my name is Nessie, by the way. I I was kidding! Nessie offers to take him home, but her tail is stuck under some rock that Messina knocked onto her. Frederick tries helping her with his magic.
Oh, I'm sorry. Clearly he has synergy like in Golden Sun, but said powers tire him out, so she just decides to get him to land, and to allow him to call for her aid by whistling a certain tune. Goodbye. So Frederick the Prince began a new life. Okay, for the sake of time, I won't stop at every strange moment they do, but for this moment specifically... What? What significance is there of him leaping into deep space and back to Earth? Sometimes stuff like this can be thematic or come off as a neat visual, but this is just him leaving Nessie and trying to go home. And while he could come back to face his evil aunt, he sees a pond full of dancing frogs and a newt and decides to live with them. Good thing Messina's not going to do anything while the throne is vacated. Some time passes, and there seems to be a romance between Frederick and this female frog, even though he's a ten-year-old just like Nessie, and this frog seems a bit older given her design. Anyway, from the song, narration, or whatever, we learn that Freddy's powers and abilities grew as he got older. Soon he got bigger, and bigger, and bigger. I am not... And I guess by years, I mean centuries, because the frogs give him clothes that match his present day attire. I can only assume that he and the other frogs were immortal, or that their pond extended their lifespans. Because how else did they all live for this long? And Freddy seems to be keeping up with modern times by fighting evil as an agent for the French Secret Service. Boy, wouldn't it be something if they explained how a frogman ever got the job? I'd sure love to know that origin story! But after the flashback ends, we finally get to the start of the actual plot. He gets a call on his frog telephone, which is fine, but now I kind of want him to just be some frog who became human instead of a human prince transformed through magic. You will see one of England's most famous and most beloved of monuments, Nelson's Cot. I don't see nothing. Are you sure this is Trafalgar Square? Damn you, Vector! So, something is stealing monuments from various locations, like the Tower of London, which vanished after a strange shadow hovers over it. It's a popular attraction for the local crows, even the punk ones, or the one with a bra. How weird. Stone by stone by stone. Hey! 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 Then Buckingham Palace gets sucked into the sky via tractor beam. The royal family is obviously upset, so the British Secret Service is now looking into it. The latter include this bumbling fool named Brigadier G, voiced by Sir Nigel Hawthorne, and this sneaky fellow named Trilby, voiced by Sir Jonathan Price. After the punk crows briefly show up to tell them what they already know, or just mock them, I don't know, word spreads that even more monuments are going missing. And since most of the British agents are gone, including... 007 in Hollywood. Heh, <laughs> okay, that's funny. The British are now asking for the best French agents. Mortifying, I'm sure. We know who's gonna be put on the case, and he's making his way through traffic like a frog can before finally showing up. <coughs> but you're a frog. Yes? And you are the head of the British Service Secret, and I understand you have a slight, uh... What do you call it? Uh, problem? Well, I think we found the best actor in the movie. Adult Freddy is voiced by Sir Ben Kingsley. He was in a lot of stuff, including as Fagin in 2005's Oliver Twist, Trevor Slattery in Iron Man 3, and Bagheera in the 2016 Jungle Book. The sound quality of this movie is all over the place, but that doesn't hinder Sir Ben's great performance as Freddy. So the British Secret Service was caught off guard from seeing a magic frogman for the first time, but they get over it quickly since they have more important things to worry about. During the debriefing, we get acquainted with two more characters, like Agent Daffers, voiced by Jenny Aguder. She looks excited about working with her new partner. Well, I don't have- Whoa, easy there! 
She was shown to have undergarments, so she wasn't going to be totally flashing them, but that part was cut out in the other version. Then there's Scotty, voiced by John Sessions. He's our Q for the movie, who shows off some gadgets, like this bulletproof bubble shield, which is also cut in the other version. But Freddy isn't interested in weapons because... The powers of the mind will always overcome violence. One of these things is going to be contradicted. So with the disappearance of Canterbury Cathedral, Freddy and his new crew set off for the horse racing track. I understand all the best criminals go there. What a quaint idea. Well, you must excuse me, I have a date for supper. Oh, you mean to say that the shady agent is actually working for the bad guy? With their choice in music cue, that sounds likely. And he's doing this in front of Freddy, who of course doesn't seem to see or question it. Anyway, I don't get how this living car, named Nico, works. She doesn't talk, only makes frog sounds, yet she has the kind of face that Benny would have. Anyway, Freddy's plan is to look at a place to get the attention of enemy spies. He got what he asked for, since some goons come over to try and rough him up. We have a message for you, FRO7, and the message is... DEATH! Well, you better give me the message. <laughs> Always remember, mind over violence. Since they don't see him jump into the stands, he gets to eavesdrop on them as they phone their leader, El Supremo, voiced by Brian Blessed. And oh look, he has Messina with him as his pet snake. I guess when she couldn't rule the world her way, she has to do it with someone else. Imbeciles! You are under instructions to follow! Observe, not to kill! Return at once to your sister and prepare for tonight's attack! The target for tonight is Big Ben. Okay, Brian Blessed also does a good job as the villain. For a children's animated movie, he can be kind of intimidating. El Supremo apparently has a whole army ready to conquer the British Isles. And then, we enter a song sequence. Evil mania, I'm gonna rule your world. And tweeze you till you drop. What the? I am seriously watching a snake lady sing a song. It's a seductive tone going on about being evil, though kudos to a good performance by Grace Jones. We have a crowd of various henchmen that seem to belong to different extremist groups. The obvious one being the Nazi lookalikes, then what might be Cobra soldiers from G.I. Joe, and even the KKK? There's also statues that seem to talk as well, and all I can say is... This is weird! While this scene got cut a bit, it was moved into another scene involving Big Ben in the other version. I think you can tell which parts got cut the most. So after a brief bit of Brigadier G trying to get the Queen to evacuate, we continue with the abduction of Big Ben. Awkward. The gang hides in Big Ben when it gets taken. Daffers tries to call G about it, but Freddy stops her by removing the batteries. Guess he thought someone might leak intel or something? Now we see the thing that's stealing all the monuments. It's... Serpentera from Power Rangers? So, did Messina use her powers to help El Supremo get the resources needed to pull this off? This seems a bit much, more so than Dr. Greet's mechanized town in The Fearless Four. Anyway, Serpent Era, look it doesn't have its own name, sucks up Big Ben with its tractor beam and starts carrying it towards the Island of Worms in Scotland. It's supposed to be uninhabited, but this is a spy movie, so naturally it has a secret base hidden beneath a dome. The bad guys realize that our heroes are in Big Ben, so they ring the bells to watch them squirm. Then it's back to Brigadier G being incompetent while talking with his French counterpart. Freddy will get in touch when his mission is accomplished. I, I, I wish I could share your... How much of this is a bedtime story? And how much of it is just John Asevsky hallucinating when writing this? Our heroes are captured and brought to the villains. We get typical spy movie banter, which is fine. 
We also see what El Supremo is shrinking these monuments for, which is to make a collection. But then comes the weird part. They're to power up this gem he has. All these represent the history of your country. The culture. Yes. The backbone of Britain. For centuries, your people have loved them, fought for them. So my best guess is that this crystal is powered by ghosts of those long gone? But wait! There's more! Supposedly, with how beloved these buildings are by people, they emit positive energy. And so by extracting it, he can turn it into negative energy. And that somehow will force mankind to a standstill. And when that happens... INVASION! DEFEAT! AND SLAVERY WILL FOLLOW! Well, it's easy to do that when your enemy can't move. Now the baddies need one more historical wonder before invasion time. Messina gets permission to attack our heroes, though she goes for Scotty and not Freddy for some reason, but Freddy breaks free and saves him. He's eventually able to beat her back, but he and Scotty get dropped into a pit of sea monsters. El Supremo then takes Daffers for himself to reprogram her brain. The snake shall rule the world. The snake shall rule the world. With the final piece he needs, he activates his device that sends all the negative energy onto Britain to make everyone fall asleep. We have nothing to fear, my queen! No one can stop us now! So, how are the other countries seeing this right now? Are they gonna respond anytime soon? Also, did El Supremo steal these creatures from the Grand Line or something? Where do they come from? Anyway, Freddy uses a whistle call to summon Nessie. She looks bigger than last time, and she ends up freeing our heroes, having to leave Scotty behind for obvious reasons. Freddy and Nessie then survey the ocean for all the submarines that the villains have. Then they go meet her family, and do a little time wasting with another song sequence. Come on, look alive, cause we're the giants of Jai. We'll rock you in the cradle of the deep. I think you sound fine, and there are some fun visuals here, but is this really the time for it? The Big Bad just put all of England to sleep and is about to send an army to wreak death and slavery. This seems like an ill fit for a spy movie, and more for the typical fantasy adventure like the beginning suggested. At the very least, save the song and dance for the after party. At most, I would accept Freddy being quickly introduced to Nessie's family before asking for help which is pretty much what happens anyway. They use seaweed to tie the submarines together and pull them off course. Also, we see that Daffers wasn't affected by the mind control. That's good. Freddy and Scotty find a guarded entranceway and take out the guards there to get their clothes. Then they bump into Daffers and help her out. Oh, Freddy. Give me frogs any day. Mm. What about me? Ooh, Scotsman are nice as well. <laughs> So now they can act as her escorts and attempt to get somewhere. What is the password? Freddy shall rule the world! <laughs> I get why that's funny now. Then we get to a... rocking fight scene? Needs more flashing and trippy images. Two out of five. Obviously, they can't get too close to the crystal without it affecting them. So Freddy, being a frog and all, breaks through the barrier and tosses the thing away. This dispels the negative ray, which makes El Supremo angry. I will kill him! I mean, he was knocked unconscious, so that will be easy. But then Freddy remembers his father's words about using his powers, and well... And if you could do all that, why didn't you use them from the start of this operation? And then they replay the same song from the earlier fight. Of course they did. They overwhelmed the villains easily, to the point where Freddy even teases the villain by deliberately turning his back on him. 
Even then the villain screws up, but then he does this. Surrender, FR07, or I will destroy your precious monument. The Queen of England would never forgive me. I... I surrender. We, we surrender. surrender! Of course the French frog says it. Also, you have powers. Use them to melt the sword or something. But no, he has to make it a big deal so that he can let Daffer sneak to the control panel and use the shrink ray on Big Ben. For a moment, I thought it was going to go straight up his ass. And then they shrink them both down. Mission accomplished! Oh wait, Messina is still here. Well, it's time for the fated showdown between nephew and aunt. What kind of form will she assume this time? Loser! You're a loser! Oh wait, a giant hyena form might be better, and she crashes again. You appear to have beaten off more than you can chew, my dear aunt. Where's she gone now? Maybe under the table she was just crushed by? Pay attention! She tries being a scorpion, but... Fang from a royal wedding is looking at you and laughing at how pitiful you are. She turns into a bigger snake and tries strangling Freddy, but he remembers his father's words again and just strangles her by the neck. So now she flies away defeated, and with El Supremo captured and the monuments returned, they hold a big celebration where the queen is even allowed to restore Buckingham Palace with the shrink ray. And yeah, it turns out Freddy did see Trilby's act of betrayal long ago, I just never thought to tell anyone, even if it would make the job easier. As they celebrate, G gets a call from the White House. Oh, I've always dreamed of going to... What do you call it? The USA! And that's for a sequel that never happens. With that, the movie ends with Nessie paying a visit, and the Crows, who did absolutely nothing to contribute, stopping by as well. And with how this shot is framed, Freddy and Daffers are now a couple. <laughs> Say, you ever hear of that movie, Bebe's Kids? The one that came out at around the same time and has a rather infamous TV spot where the tagline gets cut off? It's animation. Well, I think that applies to this movie too. Like, my word, I've seen studio sec projects that were more comprehensive than this one. Freddy's origins are so out there that it ends up being out of place with the rest of the movie. But even the main plot isn't immune to some of the weird story decisions and world building. It overshadows any attempt to build character since Freddy goes from a cowardly prince to a suave and unstoppable spy. Almost no growth is made and even the final boss is taken out rather easily with no real payoff except an unfulfilled promise of a sequel story. Seriously, they actually planned to do one, and there was even a line test released to YouTube back in 2009. But with how badly this movie grossed, even with the sort of marketing they had, they only made back around 390,000 pounds in the UK against a budget in the tens of millions. Production for any sequel was canned, and the studio behind the first movie filed for bankruptcy. That's kind of unfortunate, even if this movie wasn't all that it's cracked up to be. I do sort of like a lot of the strange elements that could probably fit in a much better story. And while not the best, there were some sequences that were well animated. At the very least, I would like to see this get re-released in higher quality since I can see this being a cult film of sorts. But hey, if John Osefsky can make his silly spy frog movie, then what's stopping me from making my fan game? Really, it goes to show that if you have the ambition and resources to do so, make your dream a reality. I mean, as long as you're not grifting like Derek Savage, anyway. Anything is possible, even if it's something like Freddy the Frog. I'm the Media Hunter. Media is my prey, and reviewing them my way. Just you be good, forget all evil. Freddy's watching, so look out, people. He's the one.